Hi, my name is Sharon Chen, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at Stanford University. In this video, I will continue the discussion on inflammatory diarrhea caused by bacteria with a focus on Campylobacter and Salmonella. A previous video was a discussion about Shigatoxigenic E. coli and Shigella. The learning objectives are to describe the epidemiology and pathogenesis of gastroenteritis due to Campylobacter and Salmonella, to describe the concept of post-infectious autoimmune sequelae, and to distinguish between non-typhoidal salmonella and salmonella typhi. Here is the overview framework again for inflammatory diarrhea. Just like for Shigatoxigenic E. coli and Shigella, the terminal ileum and colon are affected. I will focus this discussion specifically on Campylobacter jejuni and non-typhi salmonella. Campylobacter are spiral-shaped bacteria that swim using fl flagella, which are found on both ends. Unlike the other bacteria that I've talked about, it is not related to E. coli. It is in its own group, Epsilon proteobacteria. Over 20 species are thought to be pathogens, but Campylobacter jejuni and Campylobacter coli cause more than 95% of the cases. Unlike E. coli, it has different growth requirements. It can't tolerate a lot of oxygen, so it needs to be in a microaerophilic environment. Many are thermophiles. They like to grow at higher temperatures at 42 degrees Celsius. That would be a very high fever in you. Campylobacter like this higher temperature because they normally live in the GI tract of birds, and birds have higher body temperatures than us. Campylobacter are commensals in birds like chickens and other animals. Thus, these are zoonotic infections. How do you get Campylobacter infection? Well, remember, they live in birds. The most common source is from chicken feces that contaminate raw chicken. A typical scenario is cutting a raw chicken on the same cutting board that you use to prepare a salad, essentially cross-contamination. In the supermarket, 60 to 100% of chickens are contaminated with Campylobacter. So transmission is high if you are not careful about cross-contamination when preparing food. Campylobacter is the most common cause of bacterial diarrhea, especially bloody diarrhea, in the United States. More than 1 million people are infected every year in the U.S. It is more common than Shigatoxigenic E. coli and Shigella. The incubation period is one day to one week. Similar to Shigella, you get fever, nonspecific symptoms like headache and malaise, then watery diarrhea that transitions to inflammatory diarrhea associated with abdominal pain. The pathogenesis of Campylobacter is not well understood. Part of the problem is that there is no good animal model. Remember, Campylobacter is a commensal in many animals, so it doesn't cause disease in animals. The thought is that Campylobacter invades epithelial cells <clears throat> and triggers host inflammatory responses, leading to the inflammatory diarrhea. Clinically, you really can't distinguish between the bacteria that cause bloody diarrhea. However, one distinguishing characteristic of Campylobacter is a higher incidence of post-infectious sequelae. Some of these sequelae include arthritis, called reactive arthritis. This is swelling and pain of a joint. Irrit irritable bowel syndrome. These patients experience abdominal pain, bloating, and discomfort. And the most severe is Guillain-Barre syndrome. These problems occur after Campylobacter infection. Post-infectious sequelae occur because of our immune response to the infection. Let me use Guillain-Barre syndrome as an example. I'll first tell you a bit about Guillain-Barre syndrome and then discuss how Guillain-Barre syndrome is associated with Campylobacter. Guillain-Barre syndrome, also known as GBS, is a neurological disorder where you get an ascending paralysis caused by an autoimmune response. The person experiences symmetric muscle weakness, starting at the legs with difficulty walking, progressing to paralysis. The muscle weakness and paralysis then marches up the body. Severe problems arise when the respiratory muscles become weak and then paralyzed. The result is that the person needs to be intubated and mechanically ventilated to help them breathe. You can also have paresthesias, but sensory abnormalities are mild. By four weeks, the nadirs reach after progression in the first two weeks. Okay, so why does this happen? Antibodies made during Campylobacter infection against parts of the outer cell membrane, specifically against Campylobacter lipooligosaccharide antigens, cross-react with human gangliosides in peripheral nerve sheaths. The gangliosides are part of the membrane of nerve cells. You can see in the drawing that the two antigens in the boxes are the same. The left is the Campylobacter antigen and the right is the nerve cell antigen. The same antibody binds to both. The phenomenon that I just described is called molecular mimicry. 
GBS happens in 30 out of 100,000 cases of Campylobacter infection. Campylobacter is the most common infection associated with GBS, although other things are associated with GBS too. GBS typically occurs after Campylobacter infection has cleared with a range of 10 days to four weeks. Campylobacter infection is self-limited. Most cases do not need antibiotic treatment. If the disease is severe, antibiotic treatment can be given and reduces the duration of symptoms if you treat within the first three days of illness. The choice of antibiotics depends on doing a stool culture in order to get an antibiotic susceptibility profile. Many Campylobacter are resistant to fluoroquinolones, a family of antibiotics. It is a potent example of what happens when antibiotics are used in animal farming, especially poultry rearing. The increasing fluoroquinolone resistance in human disease matches the fluoroquinolone release for animal use in the 1990s. Next, I want to discuss salmonella, specifically non-typhi salmonella. Salmonella are closely related to E. coli. More than 2,000 strains have been identified based on antibody typing. You will see this identified as a serovar. For clinical purposes, the strains that we need to know about are limited. The majority are non-typhi salmonella, and they cause mostly watery and bloody diarrhea. A few strains, salmonella typhi and salmonella paratyphi, cause a completely different syndrome called typhoid fever or enteric fever. I will discuss this in a different video. Salmonella uses different hosts, as you can see from this chart. It's important to remember that salmonella can infect many animals. The two at the top are the ones that I just mentioned causing typhoid fever. These are restricted to humans. Salmonella infection in one animal may not be the same in another animal. For example, Salmonella enteritides and typhimerium infect mice and cause typhoid fever in mice, murine typhoid, but it causes gastroenteritis in humans. In fact, many of the serotypes that cause gastroenteritis in humans actually cause more systemic disease in its host animal. This is important to remember. All the non-typhi salmonella infections in humans are transmitted from animal to humans. And in the next several slides, I'm going to give you examples of how these transmissions can occur. As you saw in the previous chart, chickens can get systemic illness from salmonella infection. When this happens, bacteria can travel through the ovaries into the developing egg. The most common source of salmonella gastroenteritis in the United States is eggs from chickens infected with salmonella. If the egg is contaminated, it is not just contamination of the shell. Salmonella can be contaminating the inside of the egg because of the bacteremia in the chicken. This is why the CDC recommends that eggs be cooked and not eaten raw. Just washing the outside of the egg is also not enough. Another common source of salmonella infection is reptiles and amphibians. Many salmonella strains colonize the intestines of reptiles. A huge number of salmonella infections in the U.S. are due to infected pet reptiles and amphibians. In the United States, it is illegal to sell turtles that are less than four inches in size. Children tend to see these small turtles as toys and then put the turtle in their mouths just like any other toy. This one law has prevented 100,000 cases of reptile-associated salmonella infection in a year. Besides eggs in the U.S., there are outbreaks of salmonella infection from contaminated foods that range from peanut butter to frozen food. I have given you several recent outbreak examples on this slide. So how does this food get contaminated? It means that animal feces containing salmonella have contaminated the food in many of these cases after it's been processed. The most common animal is mice or rodents in the processing plants. So how does salmonella cause disease? Once salmonella is in the stomach, acid can kill it. So people with reduced gastric acid, like neonates, and those on anti-acid medications are at higher risk of infection. Once salmonella survives the stomach acid, it then travels to the distal gut. Here, they have to deal with the resident microbiota. In general, normal microbiota is protective against colonization by pathogens like salmonella. This concept is called colonization resistance. Animal experiments and human epidemiology studies have demonstrated that normal microbiota is protective against salmonella infection. In fact, infection risk in salmonella outbreaks is higher in people who were taking antibiotics a month prior to the outbreak. The image on this slide shows you some of the things that create colonization resistance. Fighting for micronutrients is an example. E. coli can produce siderophores to steal iron from the host and from other bacteria. Salmonella also competes for this iron. When the resident microbiota is disrupted, for example, E. coli are all killed, 
Salmonella can more easily obtain iron, and Salmonella, as the pathogen, wins. Another strategy that Salmonella uses to deal with competing resident microbiota is to invade cells. It goes into a niche that the resident microbiota can't access. Like Shigella, it enters through M cells and Peyer's patches, and it also has type 3 secretion needles, but two of them, not just one like Shigella. It uses one of the needles to inject effector molecules, such as the ones labeled in this drawing, that affect the cytoskeleton, causing the host cell to engulf Salmonella. When the host cell engulfs Salmonella, it's called a Salmonella splash, and it's quite dramatic, as you can see in this video. The host cell engulfs Salmonella into a vacuole. There are other potential ways that Salmonella can cross the epithelium. Dendritic cells extending their processes between epithelial cells can take in Salmonella, and it's also possible that Salmonella directly invade enterocytes. Regardless of how they cross the epithelium, Salmonella can survive in macrophages and dendritic cells underneath the epithelium. It then spreads to neighboring epithelial cells from the basal lateral side of the cell. Once Salmonella is inside the host cell, it remains in the vacuole instead of invading the cytosol like Shigella. It stays in the vacuole to avoid the immune system and not get killed. It can also modify the vacuole by using the second type 3 secretion system. Salmonella injects effectors into the cell through their type 3 secretion needle in order to bring things into the vacuole that it needs to survive. The video shows Salmonella in red, and the green tubes that you see are the extensions of the vacuole that Salmonella has modified to bring things into the vacuole. Living inside the cell protects it from being discovered by the immune system. However, some of the molecules of the bacteria, for example LPS, can leak into the cytosol. And when this happens, the innate immune system can detect these molecules in the cytosol. The phagocytes are activated, they start secreting cytokines that recruit other inflammatory cells. The end result is an inflammatory colitis, and this is how patients get watery and bloody diarrhea. The inflammation is beneficial to Salmonella because the inflammatory response kills many of the resident microbiota that Salmonella would otherwise have to compete with for micronutrients, among other things. How do we diagnose and treat Salmonella? Clinical symptoms are the same as other inflammatory diarrhea. Remember that you can't tell the bacterial cause of inflammatory diarrhea by the clinical signs and symptoms. Once you have a clinical suspicion, you can send stool for culture, and this will detect salmonella in addition to the other bacteria that I have discussed. The picture on the slide is a special type of culture plate in which salmonella colonies turn black so they can be distinguished from the other bacteria. Well, what about therapy? You usually don't need to treat salmonella infection. For adults and older children who have a normal immune system, treatment may only decrease symptoms by one day. That's not much of a benefit, and there's a downside. Treatment may cause these people to carry salmonella in their gut longer because the antibody kills the resident microbiota. There's evidence to suggest that older children who are treated with antibiotics are more likely to experience a relapse of salmonella infection. In some cases, you may want to treat with antibiotics, and this is especially true for people who are immune compromised. For example, HIV patients and infants, and I've listed others on the slide. These patients can have systemic spread of salmonella. It can go to the blood, bacteremia, brain, meningitis, bones, osteomyelitis, and other organs. Here's a picture of a person with sickle cell anemia who developed an ankle bone infection. You can see the lytic lesion in the bone, the, the darker black spot. The association between sickle cell anemia and salmonella bone infection is a classic example and worth remembering.